Hello class, welcome to the next segment in lecture 20. And in this segment, we're going to talk about another non-traditional or uh, something that's not a cold front or a warm front, another type of boundary that's not a cold front or a warm front. And that boundary is what's referred to as an outflow boundary. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. So first off, let's go ahead and discuss what, we exa what exactly we mean when we say outflow boundary. An outflow boundary is a current of cold, moist air that's generated by a thunderstorm downdraft. So uh, you have, uh, when a thunderstorm goes up, of course you have condensation and then usually you'll have some sort of precipitation that occurs. And when that precipitation occurs, you've suddenly got a current of colder air, relatively cold air, uh, partially due to the fact that some of that liquid water is evaporating as, it as it's coming down to ground level. But you end up with a current of cold air. And if the conditions are right, then that current of cold air can almost become like a cold front in some respects. But it's not quite the same thing as a cold front because a cold front is usually a region of cold, dry air. And an outflow boundary is a region of cold, moist air. So uh, even though the uh, in the case of a cold front, you might have cold, dry air, which is very stable. Uh, an outflow boundary, you have relatively cold, but you still have moist air. So you can actually still maintain an unstable atmosphere uh, if the conditions are right in the case of an outflow boundary. So uh, it, that's one of the key differences between a cold front and outflow boundary. Outflow boundary, it's still possible to have an unstable atmosphere on the cold side, whereas a cold front, it's really not even in the question anymore. It's uh, cold fronts, when you've got that cold, dry, and stable air, you're pretty much not going to get anything unsettled behind that. Uh, there's a couple other names that outflow boundaries are referred to as, uh, one of which is density current, which is the more technical term. Uh, it's referred to as a density current because uh, this cold and moist air has a relatively high density as opposed to the relatively warm and moist air that it's uh, traveling through. And sort of a more informal term for these is gust fronts because as these boundaries move through, they do tend to result in stronger gusty or winds uh, than you might otherwise see in a cold front. And outflow boundaries are most common with warm season thunderstorms, that is thunderstorms that occur uh, late spring, early summer, but also mesoscale convective systems are notorious for creating outflow boundaries as well. So that's the point that I just mentioned. And also squall lines, and especially in the summer, single cell thunderstorms are also great at producing outflow boundaries, which are again those currents of cold air. So here let's go ahead and take a look at a schematic that illustrates how this process actually occurs. So we have uh, papers that are falling on me. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, we have a thunderstorm that goes up and we have uh, precipitation occurring and then that precipitation then creates a downdraft which is a downward moving current of cold air. And of course this current of cold air cannot go through the ground so once it hits the ground it's got to spread out and as it travels radial radially away from the thunderstorm, that does in fact form the outflow boundary that forms that current of cold and moist air, which we know and love and that we call an outflow boundary. And typically once this outflow boundary forms, the thunderstorm that produced it is going to be in the process of decaying because this cold moist air is pretty much choked off its fuel supply and it's not going to be able to maintain itself. But as the day wears on, sometimes this cold moist air can uh, warm up and as it warms up, it can support new thunderstorm activity if the conditions, again, are, are favorable for such things to happen. But once the outflow boundary forms, it's going to be very cold and it's going to be really stable. And it's probably in all likelihood going to choke off the thunderstorm's supply of fuel. That is the thunderstorm that produced it in the first place. And if you look at this from more of a top-down perspective, typically an outflow boundary is given by a series of black dashes. Uh, so a black dash line, something like this. And uh, as a, so if this is the thunderstorm that produced it, this thunderstorm will be uh, in the process of decaying and then this boundary will just be moving radially outward away from the thunderstorm uh, as time progresses. And uh, as a, again, if this occurs early enough in the day, then you can get the sun coming out, which can heat up this cold air that is part of the outflow boundary, which can number one, slow it down. And it can also make the atmosphere unstable again, even on this uh, cold side of the outflow boundary. So. Uh, if that, uh, if again, if the conditions are right, then you can get thunderstorms that can reform on the uh, cold side of the outflow boundary. And one of the reasons why we care about these is they play a critical role in severe weather setups. And on a handful of occasions, they play an extremely crucial role in severe weather setups. And we'll talk a little bit about some cases where outflow boundaries have actually been sort of a make or break on the severe weather setup.
And one of the roles that alpha boundaries can play is they can produce vertical motions that initiate new thunderstorms. And again, they sort of act like a cold front in that respect. You have a current of cold air that's displacing warm, moist air above it, which can result in new thunderstorm development. And this is a mechanism that you most often see in the summer where the atmosphere is particularly unstable. You have really warm and moist air down near the surface. But this also can be a mechanism that comes into play uh, in the springtime where you might have conditions that are more favorable for more intense thunderstorms like supercells. So outflow boundaries can be important in that regard. They can initiate new thunderstorms. And typically, if they initiate new thunderstorms, those thunderstorms are going to be isolated. And isolated thunderstorms, as we mentioned in our segment on the dry line, is what you want if you want supercells, and you want supercells if you want potential for strong to violent tornadoes. Another thing about outflow boundaries is they are a strong uh, source of vorticity and directional wind shear. And this is not by the same mechanism as a dry line bolts. Dry line bolts is just due to is more of a dynamic effect. It's a uh, the the wind itself actually wanting to turn more. It's wanting to rotate more as it goes around the as it wants it wants to go around the dry line bulge. The outflow boundary is driven by a different mechanism called baroclinic vorticity, and that is the tendency for the air to spin due to a contrast in density. So if you've got two air masses with very different densities, and you've got uh, what's referred to as strong baroclinic vorticity, meaning at the interface of those two air masses, you have uh, strong rotation occurring. So if we want to go back to this uh, diagram, so right at the leading edge of the outflow boundary, that's where you typically have the strongest baroclinic vorticity, which means right at this interface between the warm and the cold air, the air wants to rotate. And another thing about outflow boundaries, although this isn't quite as common, is these currents of cold air can produce straight line wind damage if the winds behind them are sufficiently strong. Typically, on a, any given outflow boundary, the winds behind it are 20, 30, 40 miles per hour, which usually can't cause a whole lot of damage uh, unless there's something that's particularly vulnerable to winds of that magnitude. But on a few rare occasions, these winds in these outflow boundaries can be 50, even 60 miles per hour, which those 50, 60 mile per hour winds can cause a lot more damage than, say, a 30 or 40 mile per hour wind. And as promised, uh, I'm going to mention a couple severe weather events that... If, if not for the outflow boundary, they probably wouldn't have happened. We probably wouldn't even know about these in the first place. And perhaps the most prominent example of this is May 27, 1997, which was the afternoon of the Gerald, Texas F5 tornado. And one of the reasons why that tornado is so especially significant is it's that tornado has produced some of the most extreme tornado damage that's ever been documented. Uh, if you go back and look at some of the damage descriptors of this tornado in the aftermath, it's pretty incredible uh, some of the damage that this tornado did. It's uh, not a whole lot has been able to match it. And what's really crazy is uh, this formed in a very late spring, in very late May, and there really wasn't a whole lot of vertical wind shear. In fact, the thunderstorm that produced this tornado, it wasn't really rotating when the tornado actually touched down. It was more of a what we call a land spout, which is a tornado that occurs in a thunderstorm that's not actually rotating. And then it, uh, the, the thunderstorm itself just started spinning once the tornado got spinning. It was a really unusual uh, situation, but that tornado did some pretty insane damage. And what, one other really interesting thing about that tornado is it moved from northeast to southwest, which is in the opposite direction of tor that tornadoes normally move. So it's that was just an all-around strange tornado, but it was a very, very intense one, to say the least. And another outflow boundary event that occurred, uh, not because it was... Not because of anything particularly powerful, but this event actually produced some of the more widely known uh, live broadcast footage that's also been documented, and that is the tornado event that hit uh, north central Texas on April 3rd, 2012. And the tornadoes on that day weren't especially intense. There were a few strong tornadoes in the EF2, EF3 range, but one particular tornado southeast of Dallas produced some footage on uh, the live television coverage that... Uh, probably I don't think has been documented before and it was really something to see to, it was really something to see if you were watching the live television coverage uh, all the meteorologists were almost on the verge of freaking out because they had never seen anything like uh, what they saw happening on live television and this particular outflow boundary was due to this particular event was driven by uh, an outflow boundary left behind by a mesoscale convective system in Oklahoma as that boundary surged southward, it stalled just south of the Metroplex, and that allowed a handful of supercells to form along the boundary, and they rapidly intensified and rapidly produced strong tornadoes. 
if it were not for the alpha boundary, it would have just been a squall line event, and we would not even know about this date. But because of the alpha boundary, uh, things got a little bit more interesting. In fact, it was, people things got a lot more interesting if you were in Dallas that day. But one of the other reasons why the Gerald Texas tornado was so famous is because it produced this uh, visual, which some people refer to as the dead man walking, because it kind of looks like a human figure here. And uh, this was in its this was in its earlier stages of formation. It was more of a narrow multi vortex tornado. It didn't really have a well defined funnel. But as the tornado progressed, it, it gradually took on more of a traditional wedge shape uh, that you typically see in uh, these uh, large violent tornadoes. But uh, just a really interesting tornado all around. It, uh, unfortunately, it also killed a lot of people as uh, it devastated the town of Gerald. But uh, the main thing. Uh, that I want to talk about is the, uh, or the main thing about April 3rd that I want to talk about is this picture. And uh, there's also a link to a video, there'll also be a link to a video in the description below that shows some of the uh, helicopter footage from one of the news stations that actually captured this on camera. But that rectangular object that you see on the frame here, that is in fact a tractor trailer. And some of you may have seen video footage of this day, but this was the tornado that went through a trailer park in southeast Texas. That itself is not unusual. What was unusual is that the tornado going through the trailer park was caught on live television. And as this tornado was going through the trailer park, it was lofting these uh, tractor trailers, which were empty. It was lofting these trailers into the air, in some cases 100, 200 feet in the air. And just seeing that on live television was just... It was incredible. I mean, I don't think anything like that has ever been seen on live television coverage before from the perspective of a helicopter. So it was the first time, uh, to my knowledge, it was the first time anything like that has ever been documented on live television from the perspective of a helicopter. But uh, I do encourage you to check out the video so that you can see what exactly that tornado did. Uh, you got to see it to believe it because it's a it's just uh, really incredible what happened that day. And again, if not for the outflow boundary that stalled just south of the Metroplex, this would have been a squall line event that everyone would for would have forgotten about the next day. But that's going to do it on this uh, segment for outflow boundaries. Uh, we do have one more segment in this lecture when we're going to talk about something called a sea breeze uh, boundary slash circulation. So with that, I will see you all in the final segment. <laughs>